Hello and welcome to class 9 of the Art of Sexual and Spiritual Communion, the online Tantra course. Today's class is on the subject of Tantra and sacred sexuality. And I used an expression that some of you might be familiar with, which is you hear a lot in India, same, same, but different. And um, so I put the title as a question, Tantra and Sacred Sexuality, same, same, but different. I noticed, having spent a couple of days giving quite a lot of attention and with some interaction in, in a Tantra group, in uh, a Facebook Tantra group, with almost 10,000 members, a lot of the conversation, at least in this period of the last few days, is around the question of what is Tantra in its original sense? What was Tantra before Osho? And what was Tantra before the last 300 years? There is something that people refer to as classical Tantra, pointing back to a time when Tantra was not so exclusively associated with sexuality. It could be said that Tantra has always been associated with the creative forces, with the life force, but in ancient Tantra, the interest in the creative forces, the life force, was not exclusive to the sexual relationship. It was an interest that extended into the cultivation of life force for longevity, for health, for expansion of consciousness. The transformation of the hormonal secretions, the physical fluids into what could be considered a source of evolutionary sustenance. So it was understood that the creative forces of life in the human body were very concentrated in our reproductive secretions. And these secretions were given special importance as ways of preserving the life force. So this is one reason why in more modern conversations around Tantra, there is so much concern around what should be done in relation to the orgasm. It originates with these questions around how to preserve the life force. One thing that can be looked at in relation to this question of what is the difference or the relationship between Tantra and sacred sexuality? What distinguishes these two? And we could also ask what's the, what's the importance? What difference does it make whether we call something Tantra, whether we call something sacred sexuality? Well, one difference it makes is that our culture, I would say our culture in general, is bombarded with overt or subtle messages about sexuality. We are triggered... We're triggered into responding in certain ways through our sexuality. And this happens on such an automated level that um, this is why so much advertising uses sexual imagery or sexually stimulating imagery or the status symbols associated with sexual dominance or with sexual power. There is so much 
that you could say is unresolved in our psyche around sexuality that it becomes very easy for any talk around Tantra to become dominated by the subject of sexuality. And it is very valuable to work on our sexuality. It's very valuable to turn our experience of sexuality and our experience of relationship into something profoundly sacred. However, there are elements of Tantra that can be completely forgotten when the conversation is dominated. The conversation, let's say, around Tantra is dominated by the by our fascination and our our, our desires and our fears and our repressions and essentially our fascination with sexuality. So it can be useful to distinguish between sacred sexuality and Tantra just to remind ourselves that sacred sexuality is one element of Tantra. When we refer to them as if they were the, simply the same thing, then we might forget about all the other elements of Tantra. So, what are the other elements of Tantra? Just very briefly. We could say, as I mentioned in a, in a different class, where I tried to explain Tantra as being composed of four core elements, four core characteristics. One of these core characteristics is that Tantra is non-conformist. It challenges the systems in which it arises. It challenges the philosophical, societal, religious structures that um, have become ingrained in, in the societies that, that it has arisen in. And one of the other characteristics is that it is egalitarian, which basically means it honors the individual. It seeks to bring each person each aspect of life, it could actually be said, not just each person, but to keep it simple, it holds each person as being worthy of profound respect and upholds the dignity of the individual. So there is a tendency in Tantra to be non-hierarchical, to be non-dogmatic, and the quality of being, the characteristic of being egalitarian or equality-oriented could be actually considered as part of or a consequence of the characteristic of nonconformity. The nonconformity, when grounded in, a, in compassion, when grounded in, in a, not just rebelliousness, but profound respect for life and compassion, it's natural that the egalitarian impulse would arise out of that. So we could actually, in this model, we could narrow down the core characteristics of Tantra to just three core characteristics. The non-conformity, the orientation towards enlightenment or liberation, or moksha, as it is called in the Indian tradition, or nirvana, which is the word more used in the, in the Buddhist tradition. The third core characteristic is that it is energy-oriented, and we can understand that as also meaning that it... Let's see. If... If we understand spirituality in general to be focused on spirit, of course, <laughs> the name itself would imply that, spirituality. Spirit is usually 
referred to in contrast to matter, in contrast to embodied life, as something transcendent. And so spirituality has in general this approach of transcendence, of embodied existence, transcendence of the senses, transcendence of course also of the personality, the ego, attachments. However, in Tantra what we find is it's not that transcendence is absent, but it is it's not there in exclusion to honoring the present experience of life. So in Tantra there is transcendence as an important goal you could say or process or teaching a practice but there is also the importance given to honoring recognizing the sacredness in the present in life in all its richness, in all its diversity, in its embodied form. So, out of this third, if we if we just narrow them down to three, out of this third core characteristic of Tantra, this one takes us to also the value that is given to, to sexuality, and to sensuality in general, to our experience in the senses. Out of this honoring of the present moment, out of this honoring of life as it is arising now, arising in the body, out of that comes naturally an acceptance and an integration and honoring of sexuality itself and this impulse that is responsible for maintaining our experience on the physical plane. Not just ours as a single body, but the continuity of experience on the physical plane through sexual reproduction and actually not just through human beings sexually reproducing to create new human beings but also our life processes in each human being the cells themselves reproducing to maintain the life of the human being these life processes these these processes that can be influenced by spiritual practice, by yogic practice, by tantric practice, the life impulses within. These are all part of a spiritual tradition that honors the body, not necessarily only as a temple of the spirit, in the sense that the um, spirit is being given primary importance and the body is just a shell for the spirit. But in Tantra, in some traditions at least, some lines of Tantra, the energy itself, the life force, what we call matter or energy in in dense vibration we could we could describe that as being the nature of matter the energy itself is honored as the divine not just as a temple for the divine but as the divine so in tantra the body is not just a temple for the spirit or a temple for the divine, but it is a living expression of the divine. 
the body, the physical processes, the life force, it is all considered to be a living expression of the divine. <laughs>